Today we're taking a look at the history of the Bandai Wonderswan. It's a black and white console with a really unique design where you can actually play the game horizontally and vertically. And this black and white version was first released in 1999. It was designed by an outside studio called Koto Laboratory, a company founded by Gunpei Yokoi, the same person who used to work for Nintendo and designed things like the original Game & Watch, and he was also the co-creator of the original Game Boy. And it's thanks to that collaboration with Gunpei Yokoi that some people like to think of the Wonderswan as the true successor to the Game Boy. As well as the original black and white model in 1999, there were actually two more revisions. There was a colour version that was released in 2000, and then there was the much improved Swan Crystal which came out in 2002. The three systems combined sold over three and a half million units in Japan, and actually had a very impressive lineup of games as well from some great companies including Square, Namco and Capcom, among many others. In a future episode, I'll cover some of the defining games for the system, but in this video, we're going to go back to Bandai's roots and discover the context around the development and the release of the original Wonder Swan, beginning in 1950. Bandai's story begins in 1950. It was originally founded by Naoharu Yamashina, selling licensed toys and model kits. Throughout the 50s and 60s, Bandai released many toys and models, and their first big break came with the Astro Boy license. And later, they found a lot of success with their Gundam model kits, Power Rangers toys, and much more. All of which are still proven to be very profitable to this day. But we're here to discuss video games though, so let's skip forward a few years to 1977 and their first foray into the digital world. In 1977, Bandai released something called the TV Jack 1000. It was a first generation game console, which basically means it was nothing more than a basic Pong clone. They created several follow-ups to this, but the most interesting one was something called the Bandai Supervision 8000 in 1979, which was actually the first console in Japan to actually support multiple interchangeable cartridges. During these early years, they also released a few personal computers as well, such as this model here, the Bandai RX78 microcomputer in 1983. Most interestingly though, especially for this video, is something they released in 1986. This is called the DigiCass. It was a portable game console with interchangeable cartridges, although unlike the Wonderswan, these were only simple LCD games which you could put in the top of the console, similar to something like the Tiger R-Zone that came a bit later on. Surprisingly though, this actually did get a release in the UK, unlike the Wonderswan and a lot of Bandai's other video game systems over the years too. A few more consoles followed in the early and mid 90s including the Pladia in 1994 which was a console designed predominantly for educational purposes and the Apple collaboration Pippin which was released in 1996. Both of these systems were as you probably know commercial failures for Bandai and the company mostly got by around that time thanks to their popular line of toys, anime merchandise and other ventures into adjacent industries too. And up until this point Bandai hadn't really had much luck breaking into the video game market. Apart from licensing in some games for Nintendo. Their luck changed in 1996 though, and Bandai found huge success with its new Tamagotchi line. Tamagotchi was a simple yet addictive virtual pet which lived inside this egg-shaped handheld with a small LCD screen. I'm sure everyone that grew up in the 90s had one. I sure did. Oh, sorry. I was just feeding my Tamagotchi. The story of the Wonder Swan actually also begins in 1996, when Gunpei Yokoi, the designer of the Game & Watch and Game Boy, left Nintendo to start his own company called Koto Laboratory in September that year. Contrary to popular belief though, Gunpei didn't actually leave Nintendo because of the failed Virtual Boy, which he also helped develop. He actually left of his own accord to pursue his own passions before retirement. Unfortunately, he passed away only one year after starting this new company and didn't get to see the final release of the Wonderswan. And I do plan to share his full story in a future video because it is very interesting. And in the past few years, a lot more really interesting details about him have actually come to light, which I can't wait to share with everyone. Thankfully, before he passed away, he did get to release two games under his new company. Going back to his roots, these were actually two Game & Watch style LCD games. These games were released as part of an LCD keychain line by a company called Hero. The first game was called, and I'm gonna struggle to pronounce this, but I'll give it a go, Kuni Kun Echio, which is a snake style game. And the second one was called Professor Heno Heno, which was an original puzzle game where you moved lines up the screen to connect them in a line before they disappeared 
which actually would later on become a launch title for the Wonderswan under its new name Gunpei, which of course was a tribute to the man who designed it in the first place. The game Gunpei has since been released on many other consoles too, including the Wonderswan Color, the DS, the PSP, arcades, PlayStation, and even Japanese mobile phones through NTT Docomo, and most recently on iOS and Android as well, although of course you can't play that version anymore. Don't you just love modern gaming? Right, 1997 now and back to Bandai. In early 1997 they began drafting plans for a dedicated handheld console after the success of their Tamagotchi line. Similar to how Nintendo transitioned from the single screen Game & Watch series to the original Game Boy with its interchangeable cartridges. So of course what better person and company to team up with than Gunpei Yokoi and Koto Labs. Interestingly this almost didn't happen because originally the plan was for Bandai to team up with Sega but that fell through at the last minute due to a lot of financial issues and also some arguments from higher ups in the company that didn't want the deal to go through. Of course a few years later in 2005 a similar merger would happen with Namco to form Namco Bandai that we all know and love today. 1997 also saw the launch of Bandai's Pokemon competitor called Digimon. Originally, Digimon was actually released as a spin-off of Tamagotchi, and of course it would go on to become its own major franchise, including having lots of games for the Wonderswan. So in 1998, development was well underway on the Wonderswan. They decided to go with an NEC CPU, and although they decided to only go with a black and white screen on this first revision, it could actually show twice as many shades as the original Game Boy as well. Plus the resolution of the screen was much higher too. And at this point in development, the Game Boy Color hadn't been announced, so companies like Bandai and SNK with the original Neo Geo Pocket as well didn't really feel the need to include a color screen, although of course, as we all know, that very quickly changed because only one year after the release of the original consoles, both SNK and Bandai released their color upgrades, but I'll get back onto that a bit later on in the video. Around this time too, Pokemon had just began to take off worldwide and sales of the Game Boy were stronger than ever. So unfortunately, due to things completely outside of Bandai's control, they were already facing an uphill battle before the Wonderswan had even managed to get released. The Wonderswan was finally revealed to press at a special event the day before Tokyo Game Show on the 8th of October 1998. Thanks to some help on Twitter, I managed to track down some of the press releases from this time. There was a Japanese website called NLab that had a really detailed news story from the event, including a full rundown of the press release by Takashi Mogi, who was the president of Bandai at the time. There's some interesting tidbits in here, so let's have a quick look through it. Apparently, Bandai's target demographic was 15 to 19 year olds, so a slightly older audience than Nintendo's Game Boy, despite the toy-like appearance of the console. A launch window of March 1999 and a price of only 4,800 yen was also revealed, as well as some of the companies that were on board too, including Namco, Taito, Data East, Jailco, and Koei. The cost of the games was announced to be between 3,000 and 4,000 yen, and that 10 games would be ready in time for launch, as well as 50 coming by the end of summer that year. They also shared some interest in future plans, including some integrations with Japanese mobile phones and computers. Only 13 days after that announcement though, the Game Boy Color went on sale in Japan. Moving on to 1999 now, and on March the 4th, the Wonderswan was finally released in Japan, retailing for only 4,800 yen as they promised, which only equated to around 30 pound at the time, which is just insane to think about. Imagine walking into a shop now and buying a brand new game console for 30 pound. That's just insane. So this was pretty much an impulse buy for a lot of people at the time. And that is incredibly cheap, even for back then, because the Game Boy Color had released at 8,900 yen, which was around 80 pounds. Despite its power, good set of launch titles, and extremely cheap price, it just couldn't hold its own against Nintendo, despite Bandai releasing several upgrades and many impressive games in the following years. There were some other really interesting things that Bandai did with this as well, including releasing a development kit so that fans could actually make their own games for the system. And some of those games, like Judgment Silver Sword here, actually got full physical releases, which is just so cool. You just don't see anything like that happening these days. 
The games themselves came in cardboard boxes that were very slightly smaller than the Game Boy releases, and the games themselves actually featured a really interesting design where the pins on the bottom of the cartridge are actually exposed, which is kind of scary, but when they slot into the back of the system, the pins get covered up by the console itself. And I just love the really neat, compact design of this. But that's it for part one of the history of the Wonder Swan. Join me next time where I actually take a look at all of the different console variations in a lot more detail, as well as some of the best games available for the system. So thank you so much for watching, and a massive thank you to Quang from Asobi Tech for letting me borrow some of his Wonder Swan collection in order to make these videos. If you enjoyed this, please consider checking out Patreon to join everyone going up the side of the screen here, and I'll see you all again very soon for part two. Goodbye.